Hello and welcome to the Algebras. In this lecture, lecture number 10, we will talk about Cartan subalgebras of semi-simple D algebras. So throughout the lecture, G denotes a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra over the field C of complex numbers. And H denotes some Cartan subalgebra of G. Recall from the previous lecture that we already know that the Lie algebra H coincides with the set of all elements in G, which are killed by a high enough power of the adjoint operator associated to some regular element of G. The main result of today's lecture is the following theorem. Part A. The restriction of the killing form of G to the Cartan subalgebra H is non-degenerate. Part B. The Cartan subalgebra H is abelian. Part C. The Cartan subalgebra H coincides with its centralizer in G. And finally, part D, the adjoint operator in G associated to any element H in H is diagonalizable. Let's start by proving part A. We consider the decomposition of the Lie algebra G in generalized eigenspaces associated to our regular element G. So for each lambda in C, as in the previous lecture, we consider G sub G upper lambda. This is a set of all elements in G, which are killed by high enough power of add G minus lambda. Now the key statement. The claim is that G sub G upper lambda and G sub G upper mu are orthogonal with respect to the killing form on G unless lambda plus mu is equal to zero. So let's prove an easy special case of this statement. Assume that x is an element in g sub g upper lambda such that the bracket of g with x is equal to lambda x. So x is a proper eigenvector for at g with eigenvalue lambda. Similarly, assume that y is a proper eigenvector for at g with eigenvalue mu. So the bracket of g and y is equal to mu y. Then we can write lambda times the value of the killing form at the pair x and y as the value of the killing form at the pair the bracket of g and x and y. So this is because the bracket of g and x is equal to lambda x and k is a bilinear form. Now we can use associativity of the killing form first to change the bracket of g and x to minus the bracket of x and g, and then by associativity to change the whole value to minus the value of the killing form at the pair x and the bracket of g and y. And finally, we use that the bracket of g and y is equal to mu y to write this as minus mu times the value of the killing form at the pair x, y. From this equality, in the case where k of x, y is non-zero, we deduce that lambda plus mu must be zero. This was a special case where x and y were proper eigenvectors. For generalized eigenvectors, one can use similar arguments and induction on n plus m, where n is a power of at g minus lambda, which kills x, and m is a power of at g minus mu, which kills y. This is a nice exercise to do. The consequence of this lemma is that our Cartan subalgebra H, which coincides with G sub G upper zero, must be orthogonal with respect to the killing form to any G sub G upper lambda, where lambda is a non-zero complex number. Since we know that the killing form of a semi-simple Lie algebra is non-degenerate, its restriction to H must be non-degenerate as well. This completes the proof of claim A of our theorem. Let's do claim B. Recall that the kernel of the adjoint representation of any Lie algebra is the center of this Lie algebra. Also recall that the center of any semi-simple Lie algebra is zero. Consequence, the adjoint representation of any semi-simple Lie algebra is injective. So let's consider the image of our Cartan subalgebra H under the adjoint representation of G. So this realizes H as a subalgebra inside GL of G. Note that by definition a Cartan subalgebra is nilpotent, so this image at G applied to H is also nilpotent and hence solvable. So now we can use the most general version of Cartan's criterion for solvability, which says that a subalgebra 
S of some general linear algebra is solvable if and only if for any element A in S and for any element B in the commutator of S with itself, the trace of AB is zero. If we apply this criterion to our solvable algebra at G of H, we get that the image of H under at G must be orthogonal with respect to the killing form to the derived algebra of this image. Since we already know that the restriction of the killing form of G to H is non-degenerate, this orthogonality forces the second part to be zero. And as we already mentioned, since the adjoint representation of G is injective, this means that already the first derived algebra of H is zero. So H is indeed abelian. This completes the proof of part B of our theorem. Let's do part C. Part C is the easiest part. So we need to prove that the Cartan subalgebra H coincides with its centralizer. However, the centralizer of H of course is contained in the normalizer of H. The centralizer is a set of elements in G which commute with all elements in H, while the normalizer in the set of elements in G such that the bracket of this element with H belongs to H. So centralizer is contained in the normalizer, and by definition any Cartan subalgebra is self-normalizing. So the centralizer of H belongs to H. However, from part B, we know that H is abelian, so the centralizer of H must coincide with H. So now we have to move to the proof of part D. This is the most difficult part, and it requires some additional detour. So let's talk about derivations of semi-simple Lie algebras. We will need the following claim. Any derivation of a finite dimensional semi-simple complex Lie algebra G is inner. That is, this derivation has a form at G for some element G in G. So we denote by D of G the Lie algebra of all derivations of G. We know that for any Lie algebra G, the set of derivations of G forms a Lie algebra. Let us note that the adjoint representation realizes G as a subalgebra of D of G. And we have already noticed that G has no center, so the adjoint representation is injective. The adjoint re representation really realizes the whole of G as a subalgebra of the algebra of all derivations of G. We claim that this subalgebra is in fact an ideal of the algebra of all derivations. To prove this, fix a derivation delta and let g and x be two elements in g. Then we want to compute the action of the commutator of delta and the adjoint operator of g at x. So we use the definition of the commutator and this is equal to delta applied to at g of x minus at g applied to delta of x. Now we use the definition of at g and get that the first summand is delta applied to the bracket of g of x and the second summand is the bracket of g and delta of x. Since delta is a derivation, when we apply delta to the bracket, it means that we should apply it to the first component and take the bracket with the second, and then add the first component and bracket with the derivation applied to the second component. And now we see that this second summand cancels with the bracket of g and delta of x, which comes from the second summand in the previous formula. Consequently, the whole thing is equal to the bracket of delta of g and x, and by definition, this is the same as the joint operator of delta of g applied to x. So it follows that the bracket of delta with add g equals to add of delta of g, and this is an element in the image of the joint representation of g. This proves our lemma. So add g realizes g as an ideal of the algebra of all derivations of g. Consequence. The restriction of the killing form from the Lie algebra of all derivations of G to the ideal at G coincides with the killing form on G. This is true for any restriction of a killing form from a Lie algebra to an ideal. At the same time, G was a semi-simple Lie algebra, so the killing form of G is non-degenerate. This means that if we take the orthogonal complement of at g inside d of g, 
The intersection of the orthogonal complement of add G with add G must be zero. This is because the killing form is non-degenerate, and if that intersection would be non-zero, that intersection would be the kernel of the killing form on G. So we can write the Lie algebra of all derivations of G as a direct sum of two ideals. First ideal is the image of G under the adjoint action, and the second ideal is the orthogonal complement of the first idea. We know that the orthogonal complement of an ideal in any Lie algebra with respect to the killing form is again an ideal. Now let delta be some element in the orthogonal complement of add g. On the previous slide we had a computation which said that for any element g in g the adjoint operator of delta of g equals the commutator of delta with add g. However, delta belongs to the orthogonal complement of add g and add sub g belongs to add g. So this commutator, because both are ideals, must belong to the intersection of these two ideas which is zero. So this means that any element delta of the orthogonal complement of add g commutes with any adjoint operator associated to any element in g. Since the adjoint representation is injective, it follows that delta must be the zero map because the adjoint representation of delta of g is the zero map for any g in g. Consequence is that delta is a zero map, so the orthogonal complement to add g must be zero, which means that add g coincides with the algebra of all derivations in g. So indeed, every derivation on a simple finite dimensional the algebra over complex numbers is an inner derivation. So now we can proceed with the proof of the part d of our theorem. Recall that that part d claims that for any element h in our Cartan sub algebra h, the corresponding adjoint operator add h on the whole algebra g is diagonalized. To prove this, we consider the Jordan Chevalier decomposition of this operator at H into a sum of two operators D and N, where D is a diagonalizable operator, N is an important operator, both D and N are polynomials in ad H, and they commute. So by definition, since N is a nilpotent operator, D acts on each generalized eigenspace of ad H with eigenvalue lambda as the scalar lambda. From this, it is easy to derive that D is actually a derivation of G. Indeed, let's take any element X in G sub H upper lambda and any element Y in G sub H upper mu. Then we know that the commutator of these two elements must belong to G sub H upper lambda plus mu. So D applied to this bracket. So since the bracket of X and Y belongs to G sub H lambda plus mu, then D applied to it equals lambda plus mu times the bracket. Now we can write this as a sum of two elements, the bracket of lambda x and y plus the bracket of x and mu y. So we distribute in the first sum lambda times the bracket of x, y and move lambda to the first component of the bracket using the bilinearity. And similarly, in the second sum, we move mu to the second component of the bracket. So lambda x equals to d of x and mu y equals to d of y. So we get the d of the bracket x y is equal to the bracket of d of x with y plus x with the bracket of d of y. So d is a derivation of g. Because of the previous theorem, any derivation of g is inner. So d coincides with the adjoint operator for some element in g. So since add h belongs to the image of g under the adjoint operator and d belongs to the image of g, we conclude that n also belongs to the image of g under the adjoint operator. Now recall that h is an abelian algebra. We know this from part b of the theorem. From this, it follows that h belongs to the centralizer of a H, because H is a billion and H is an H. Since both D and N are polynomials in H, it follows that they both also belong to the centralizer of H. In particular, because the Cartan subalgebra equals with its centralizer, this is a part C of our theorem, it follows that both D and N actually belong to H. 
Finally, for any element x in H, we know that the product add x and add n is nilpotent because add n is nilpotent and add x and add n commute. So the trace of any nilpotent element is zero, which means that the value of the killing form at the pair x and n is zero. So this implies that n must belong to the kernel of the restriction of the killing form to the Cartan subalgebra H. Using part A of the theorem, we know that this kernel is equal to zero. So n is a zero element of G. It follows that add H is equal to D, and this is a semi-simple element by definition. So this completes the proof of our theorem. Let us note a couple of consequences from this theorem. First consequence is that any Cartan subalgebra of G is a maximal with respect to inclusions commutative subalgebra of G. This follows directly from part C, which says that any Cartan subalgebra of G coincides with its centralizer. If there is a bigger commutative subalgebra, then it must belong to the centralizer of a Cartan subalgebra, and Cartan subalgebra coincides with its centralizer. Next consequence, any element of G which belongs to a Cartan subalgebra has the property that the corresponding adjoint operator is diagonalizable. This follows immediately from the proof of D, where it was shown that the linear operator N is equal to zero. In particular, any regular element of G has the properties that the corresponding adjoint operator is diagonalizable. This is because any regular element of G belongs to the Cartan subalgebra defined as a set of all elements in G, which are killed by high enough power of add G. G is killed by the first power of add G, so it belongs to this Cartan subalgebra. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the lecture.